Let me first ask, how many of you are actually just getting started with a program? Because I see a lot of experience around the table here. Does, does everybody have a program? Actually, I don't. Okay. So I'll, 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 be, uh, I'll temper everything I'm saying by, let's keep this, if somebody has to say anything, go ahead. We don't have all that much slides, lots of opportunity to talk. And I very much uh, 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 was grateful for your presentation and, and his uh, translation. But, I mean, you, you've got a program that is state of the art. It's, it's uh, perfect. And so I told the group earlier that they should speak to the, you know, you've got local expertise and go make uh, visits and such to, to sort of help learn for, for themselves as well. So what we'll do is, um, I was just going to talk again about the elements and design of an effective program. And when Dr. Goldstein and, and Kylie Hill and, and, and such, we were talking, we, we did want on purpose to have some, some duplication and repetition planned because these are important fundamental aspects. I'll talk about some very practical steps for getting started and some of the missteps and the difficulties we had when we were getting started and, and sort of where we've gone. And then we'll talk about some problems and, and such in terms of uh, not only starting but, but moving forward after you, you start a program. So again, you know, it's uh, a program is as, as big, as good, as, as well designed as you have resources. So if you have a program that uh, your staff is an exercise uh, physiologist and a dietitian and a pharmacist and four physiotherapists and on and on and on. It's very different than if you have a program that has, uh, you know, one nurse and a physiotherapist or something like that. So theoretically, it's a multidisciplinary or interprofessional program. So you have the right person doing the right job. Uh, you want to optimize, as mentioned, the physiology. So you try and optimize your therapy or you hope that that's already been done and package that with psychological social, not only for their patients and their caregivers. And one of the things that we, we do that we've been fortunate is we, we ask our patients to bring along a spouse or a friend to exercise with them. And that's actually been very, some people say no, but others it's been very helpful, particularly with maintenance ongoing. And, and your program, again, it could be very comprehensive care or it could just be group exercise, people walking or going around the track or, or, or we have in malls, we have uh, satellite programs in malls uh, that we, we don't have to pay for the rent. Uh, the malls like them because the patients come and they go to the drugstore, then they eat, and then they go find groceries and so forth. Um, and things like access and parking and buses are, are easy. We also have uh, programs in hockey rinks where they walk around the rink. And you know, this is, you, you kind of make do with whatever you have. And being from Canada, we have a lot of hockey rinks and curling rinks that they will walk around the, the curling rink, especially in, in, in the winter time. Um, some of the ingredients is to, to spend more time actually starting the program and less time thinking, worrying, and planning. Because we often spend so much time, how are we going to make a program that is so big that in fact we never get started. So the, the best thing, take that first step Start the program, you know, do some work, make sure it's, it's as best as it can be, and then improve, make it bigger, evaluate, those sorts of things. But getting started. And we have colleagues, where I come from, that want to design a program, spend so much time that it, it just uh, is consuming. You're going to hear from Dr. Hill about how to evaluate. Evaluation is very important, and I'll show you data that we collected, we were fortunate enough to, to start at the beginning, that allowed us to grow. Important data from an administrator's point of view that they found very meaningful. You want to keep a focus. I said laser-like focus on what matters most. Try not to do too much of stuff that isn't goal-oriented. Now you have to do a little bit because you want to make life interesting. You have to make sure that the patients are having some fun, but stay focused on what matters most. And what matters most is your aerobic exercise. And then try and actively recruit your patients and then work to keep them in the program. And one of the problems we had, we, we started with a program and in fact we didn't tell anybody because we were just working furiously on getting a program and initially we had uh, trouble finding patients. They were there, we just weren't connected to them. So there was a big lag and we had to work at that. So your audience to try and look at recruitment are your colleagues, your physician colleagues, your, your physiotherapists and so forth, and then your patients. So, you need to get your colleagues, and that includes your administrators, to believe 
and sometimes that could be a capital B, believe, and accept that pulmonary rehabilitation is effective, achievable, and you can deliver. Because they're not going to give you the resources if they don't believe you can do what you say you have to do. So the safety net there is start small, evaluate, and then tell them what you, you know, this is what I'm going to do, this is what I'm doing, and this is what I did. And then you try and get more resources building along the way. So you need to assure them and demonstrate that they're not going to lose their money and your colleagues won't lose their patients and that you're not going to turn them off because you don't want unintended consequences. You want your patients to be your biggest advocates. Your patients will advertise for you because they, they feel the benefit, they will tell their friends, and if you're doing your job right, most of the time they, they tend to come back. So you need to get them over that initial hump because they don't want to come. They'll come because they trust you, they'll come because they, they you know, maybe don't believe but they want to get you off their back. But if, once they can start to realize a benefit, kind of after, into that second week or whatever, if you're doing three times a visit, they'll start to feel good, they'll start to develop a relationship with some of their other people in the program and, and the staff as well. Because your staff, by definition, working with people with chronic diseases are going to be friendly, they're going to be engaging, your staff will make them, the patient smile and all those sorts of things. And then we need to try and keep them for that initiation phase, 6, 8, 10, 12 weeks, whatever it is. So what matters most is the right team members. Try, try, try to make sure you get a physiotherapist or an exercise therapist at the beginning because they will make sure that the program is as effective as possible. If you can't, then you're, you still can be done, but your job is tougher. Just like Dr. Goldstein said, if you have a dietitian, great. If you don't, well, then you've got to sometimes do the job of the dietitian. Probably not as good as the dietitian would do. So if you can get somebody who knows exercise, do that. And I would, I would aim for that. Your aerobic exercise is foundational. So walking, pedaling, treadmill as we talked this morning. Strength, resistive, stretching, all those sorts of things are additive on top of aerobic. But if you have to make a choice and you have limited resources, just stick with aerobic. If you can do more, do more. A little education just to get them to exercise. And again, if you have multiple programs in the country, and if somebody already has ec ec uh, education, use their education for your program, you know, or, or take something and translate it. And there are available resources all over. You don't have to reinvent, because this takes time. Education takes time to come up with your own patient materials and so forth. The socialization psychological support comes for free, but very powerful. You need to, to give them a reason to come. And, and uh, that's what's going to keep them coming back for more. And then, as I said, evaluate outcomes, important outcomes. Not only patient-centered outcomes like six-minute walk or St. George's, but, but also outcomes that matter to the, to the HMOs or the ministry or the administrators. Dollars, hospitalizations, ER visits, those sorts of things. Um, when you do outcome evaluation, once you've proven that your program is effective, you may want to decide to stop doing it. So for instance, we did St. George's Respiratory Questionnaire for 11 years. We stopped last summer because, you know, every time we measure it, it's the same thing. It'd be getting big signal. Uh, eight, eight, uh, eight point reduction at three months. Uh, and we've basically now said, you know what, it's like aspirin for an MI. We're going to stop measuring. It works. But when we have a new program, we measure it to make sure the new program does what it's, what's, uh, it's supposed to do, what it's designed to do. What about using the cat, for instance? The yeah, sure. Simpler, yeah. much simpler. When we so started, far, uh, and, and if you've got exercise testing results and you can tailor high intensity, go for it. But I, I, if I were starting a program, I would not start with high intensity. You, you, it's too complicated. You, you'll spend too much resources for, for less output than you would to help more people. It's more personalized service. So if I, like if, exercise, like CPIT? well, CPIT would be very helpful. But also, um, uh, you know, if I get Anon to do high intensity exercise, he's not going to like it. So I have to stand here and I say, keep pedaling, oh. faster, keep going. You're doing well. Keep going. You know, there's th those sorts of resources. So it's human resources. Whereas if I do low exercise intensity, I say, go walk around, go walk, in, you know, ten times, and then I stand back and make sure he doesn't fall sort of thing. But high intensity, it's fairly personalized. And if you have, uh, if you've got a lot of human resources, a lot of physiotherapists, it can work. 
but you're not going to be able to help as many people. So, for instance, we have, a, we have one main program, and then we've got about seven programs. Uh, we call it like a hub and spoke. And in the main program, uh, we have about 150 people. The high intensity is less than 10. It, it's just, it's and a lot of work. Is sort of patient choice or your choice? Uh, it's our choice, probably. Mm -hmm. Yeah. We say it's their choice, and we, you know, we have no, a conversation, but... In this, and perhaps I didn't say myself correctly, you know, there is the patient you need to push, for, as you said, yeah. to do high intensity, uh, and, and there is the patient that will do it naturally. You just tell him, do it as hard as you can, yeah. and then you can go away, yeah. and he does it. So will, will, will it be this sort of selection or something different? Well, yeah. So the ones that are doing it are the, kind of the self-select, the ones that want to do it. Yeah. Because we, we don't have, we'd rather help 150 people than four. You know, I, you could do it, but it's a, it's a choice, hey, because we can only do so much. Okay. Yeah. And then, um, yeah. So then I, what we did is when we, this is from the Canadian Respiratory Journal, just talked to six sort of That's simple. Can you send the, the reprint or the PDF to me because I'm not sure it's open to the general public. This okay. Is, uh, uh, well, if you go, if you go to, uh, it's on the respiratoryguidelines.ca, uh, okay. you get it free. If you go okay. through the journal, you have to pay for it. Okay. But I'll, I'll send you the PDF, yeah. Okay. So um, uh, it's sort of in a systematic review addressed six questions. And we, we tried to formulate the questions that were, uh, we did a needs assessment and so forth for sort of simple things. And some of them are Mickey Mouse, especially if you've, if you've got a program. But, you know, the question was hospital versus non-hospital based. And, in fact, the evidence is very good that if you have a coordinated, integrated program, so it has to be, you just can't say go home and exercise. You have to touch them, you have to be in contact with them and so forth. The home program is as good. Pure home are probably not as good as integrated where maybe they come once a week together with home or something like that. But the evidence is fairly strong that in a, a well-run and integrated coordinated program, home-based is effective. The second one was the, the question of resistance plus aerobic. And you know, Aerobic is the foundation of therapy. If you can, resistance anaerobic is better than aerobic by itself. But resistance by itself, no benefit. So again, if you have to make choice and you have a, a limited resources, go with aerobic and just a little resistance or no resistance at all. The program length, again, traditionally we've had eight week programs and then you graduate. And then everybody stops exercising. So we've tried to change the philosophy. There's no magic way how to do it yet. What's the most effective? But, but use that eight week or 10 or whatever as an initiation phase to lifelong. And then you try and help them to continue in the, in, in the long term. The question is, how do you do it? And nobody has found the magic answer. Um, so our colleagues in Edmonton are, are doing tele-rehab. Uh, with, with the get the everybody together via telehealth. Um, uh, uh, colleagues in Edmonton, a different group, are using um, uh, the Sony Wii and the uh, three, uh, Xbox 360 exercises to have their patients do pulmonary rehab. And, you know, so everybody's trying. We, we try and get our people to come back uh, once a week. They have a phone call from one of our staff members once every two weeks, and then we build in some social things about once a month. And we've had some success. It's, 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 uh, it's not perfect though, so we're trying to, to uh, get better. The question of who are the populations, and right now, because of a lack of data, there's no evidence that mild COPD patients benefit from rehab, but moderate, severe, very severe do. The biggest signal is probably in that severe group. The really, really bad, you'll help, but the, you know, it's very intensive, and the moderate you'll help, but they could probably do well by themselves. So the severe group is kind of where I'd start. The people who have been ad admitted to hospital would also be a, a, a one that you could perhaps show a difference. And all the evidence and the papers and so forth are discussed in, in the, this is that website, respiratoryguidelines.ca. That has also the Canadian thoracic, yeah. so all the asthma, the sleep, mechanical ventilation, so it's, it's actually, still, so it's oh yeah, all for free. But I'll, I'll send you the PDF anyway. And then in Canada at least, there was a, there was, it was starting to go around the males and females behave differently in their response. And we now have more females being diagnosed with COPD than males because smoking rates are higher in females than males. Uh, here you still have more males than females yet. Yeah. 
But, but uh, anyway, there's no difference. There's benefit in both, no distinction. No gender, exactly. And we, we do allow smokers into the program. We try and then get them to quit smoking. Just like the cardiologist will take care of people who are overweight, the people will take care of diabetics who have dessert, we, we don't judge. We, we try not to judge. We, we bring them in and then we try and get them to quit. But if, if they're still smoking, we're still going to, to, to do them. Uh, and then the question of one month uh, falling hospitalization. And this is very different than four or five years ago when we, we were all telling our patients, you come back when you're better, which would be two, three, four months down the road in practice. Now we're saying once you're stable, you come back, we'll help you get better faster in the, in the rehab program. And, uh, and th th that's a big drain on resources, especially with the amount. You know, COPD in North America is the most common chronic medical condition for being admitted to hospital more than ischemic heart disease, more than heart failure, more than diabetes, more than renal failure. So, you know, we have a lot of patients that are being admitted. The, the length of the program for uh, post-AE uh, we have is, is what? Our initiation phase would be eight weeks. The same eight weeks? Yeah. Whether it's post-AE or... Yeah. And they're able to cope with it eight weeks? Yeah, AE? but they start small, yeah. you know, and then they slowly build. And, but we, we deliberately don't say our program lasts eight weeks. We, our program is forever, mm -hmm. but it's the eight-week initiation phase and then maintenance phase. And, and you know, it's, uh, it's just, uh, it, you're playing with words. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And how, how do you get the patients, uh, how do you know about the new patients, for instance? Do you have a, a pipeline sending you the, to the EMRs, sending you notes? Uh, yeah. Mr. Jones has been admitted and he's just being discharged with the post acute hospitalization. How do you know? So we have this chronic disease management program uh, that anytime somebody is admitted to hospital with COPD or is discharged with COPD, uh, we find out. It gets it sent to us. We have, we have nurses that work in the hospital. Uh, if they're admitted, um, we don't need a referral. We just go see them. And uh, when they're in hospital, they are seen by somebody from the pulmonary rehabilitation program. If they're one of our participants, we say, you know, as soon as you get better, you come back. We'll see you in two weeks or next Monday or something. If we've never seen them before, you're saying, my name's Trent. You're going to get a phone call from me next week or something, and we're going to tell you to come to the rehab program. And what's involved is this. So they kind of build up a personal thing. And it happens automatically now. Now, the guidelines... And None of the guidelines of the COPD guideline actually recommends doing a spirometry during uh, the AE itself. Yeah. Now we know that a lot of them are not COPD. That's so correct. You do, so you do the first spirometry, so you don't know have COPD, yeah. that's totally covered. Yeah. So, so good point. So if, if they've had spirometry before, good. If they've never had spirometry, we will do one before they go home, mm -hmm. recognizing it's not perfect. And the one we'll do two months from now will be, will be better. How many non COPD one, one third. One third is non COPD. Yeah. That's interesting to know. Because Isn't that amazing, though? Yeah. yeah. No, I, I, that's no I'm amazed by that all the know, time. Until you see it. But yeah. 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 And it's, it's um, they're treated for COPD, they've been labeled COPD, and they have spirometry and, and that is. You, have, you know what? Even if you saw them, and you sort of struck out the diagnosis. The, the it comes back. Get, yeah. It comes back. It, it even comes back when they have normal spirometry sometimes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. That's what I said. Yeah. So the way we've sort of tied this together is, is, is that continuum of care where you have somebody in hospital and outpatient to try and connect them. Because when they're in hospital going home, there's things you can do to stop them from being admitted to hospital. There's things you can do in the outpatient setting to stop them from being admitted to hospital. And there's, it's often disconnected and there's gaps, barriers. So we've sort of designed the program that has three pillars. One is our exercise and rehab. So for patients who are markedly impaired, disabled, we have fairly intensive pulmonary rehabilitation. For the milder people, we have group exercise. They, it's a walking club, essentially. They socialize and they do walking. And it's, it's still done within your system? Or is well, it's within our system. But, but uh, you, may have, uh, you may have 80 people with only two staff members. Okay. So they're there to phone for help or to you know, provide advice. Whereas the more intensive program, a lot more staff, right? Can you describe the staff? Okay, the, we, we have about, most of our staff are physiotherapists mm -hmm. and, and uh, half are physio, half are exercise therapists. What's 
and uh, kinesiology, phys physical education uh, people. Ah, okay. Not not a PhD, not a physiologist, but they would have a a BSc kinesiology phys ed. Okay. Yeah, and uh, and then and then our program has access to dietitians, pharmacists, and then we have quite a few what we call nurse clinicians. Um, like for instance, I have four COPD nurses working with me, um, who keep me busy, and they're they're gifted. I mean, they're very good people. But I mainly do COPD and exercise and things. Eh? Uh, what is the proportion of physiotherapists per patient? Well, in in a, uh, in the intensive program, we would have um, two two staff members for twelve people, probably. In the very these are the sickest people. In the less sick, it's as high as we always have two people, so someone to help and one to call for help, just in case. It never happens, but it'd be as high as, as 80 people. And, and uh, how many physicians do you So the physicians, uh, we, we are in the same building as the cardiac rehab, so there's always one doctor for backup. But what we do is uh, those people don't see a doctor at the time, but they're all seen by a specialist, and they're all seen by, a, by their family doctor as well. And at some time. But you will see every patient before we start the program? No. Or one a physician? A physician will. But a physician out of the program is eligible? Yes. Yeah. And we did that on purpose because we had the, per oh, yeah. we had the perception that if, if, if I'm going to see all of them, some of our, our doctors may think we're taking their patients away from them. And we wanted to go away from that. Now, if we have a patient who's not optimally managed, we, we sometimes contact the doctor and say, do you know, you know, they're not on this, or they're not, and the doctors have been very good. They've been very good. Sorry, you were? Yeah, um, from the morning we always talk about COPD. Um, we have a huge program around the school. We're seeing 8, 000, over 8,000 patients a year. But we include all of them. We have multiple bronchitis disease, post-cancer surgery, yeah. pre-transplant, post-transplant. Are you not seeing them? Fibrosis, we have, I mean, we have maybe, maybe 50% of them COPD, maybe. Yeah. The rest are Others. any other disease. In are, rehab or? In rehab. Or in your practice. The same group, they're all together. Each one has his, his own personal program, but yeah. they're all in the same group, in the same 12, 10, yeah, so most of our, we do have transplant people both before and after. Uh, we do have a few people with pulmonary hypertension, not that many, and, and, uh, and interstitial lung disease. Easily though, three quarters, 75% are COPD. And what about bronchiectasis? Bro uh, bronchiectasis? We don't have much bronchiectasis. Our TB rates are sky low. Our, we don't have TB here no, either. But, but we don't have much bronchiectasis. Yeah, we don't. Is that right, eh? No, we don't. And I, I work with, uh, in my division, we have 16, 16 uh, sort of respirologists in, in the division. Yeah. And we sort of... For the exercise, uh, uh, kinesthesiology, for whoever, write the exercise prescription without a uh, uh, in, in physician being involved? So the, the, uh, they write the prescription. And because we don't have every patient seen by me, we send a note to their doctor. If it's a specialist or GP, we start at the highest, saying, is it okay for this person to exercise? And we get yes, no, maybe. We never get no. Sometimes we get a maybe and we have to call. Um, and, and that, so that the doctor knows that they're going into the program. But they're not formally assessed. A lot of programs do do a formal assessment. They're not formally assessed by respirologists that enter to the program. And we did that because it, we tried that and we found that that slowed down access to pulmonary rehab, especially when, when we want it to grow. I'm, I'm not sure that's the best way to do it because other programs have a formal assessment. Mm -hmm. and, and, and it's sort of a, this is disregarding of the patient's complexity or severity. You sort of leave, leave that uh, entry criteria, so to speak, to the GP, basically. GP or specialist, yeah. Yeah. It's problematic because some patients have severe osteoporosis, 
born metastasis? I don't know. So we do have exclusion things. So for instance, if they have metastatic cancer, so we have little red flags that they would notify us. You, you have a, a sort of an admittance uh, document Assessment? For, the yeah, yeah. For, the, for the GP that you sent it out and said, please fill that and sign it down? No, uh, we do a history ourselves. We do all so, the histories ourselves. So we will, in this sense, be the kinesiologist, uh, the physio or the kinesiologist? Who will take the history because you're not seeing the patient? The physio or the kinesiologist will. And then if he has yeah. a problem, he, he refers the yes. to you or to one the physician yes. involved in the patient. Now, the other I will say, yes. Do you have a facility for uh, 12 patients uh, to exercise at the same time, like treadmill, bikes? Yes. Like, do you have a facility for... We, we have a... Uh, we, we, the center that we use uh, is used for university indoor games uh, exercise. So we have a 300-meter track. We have, a 300-meter track. We have, a, we have an indoor 300-meter track. So there are about 1,000 cardio cardiac people that sometimes exercise in that building. Okay. We have a big facility. That's our big one. And then we have, we have smaller ones where we have, uh, you know, 20 people that are walking in a mall and we might have, uh, you know, six bikes, six treadmills sort of thing. Okay. Yeah. But it's in the university. Yeah, university, yeah. Now, and so in, in smaller communities we have, you know, we uh, kind of rehab in a box. We've, we've sort of said we're peripheral sites. Uh, now, in our center, even though I don't, we don't do a formal assessment, they all get a cardiac exercise test at, at entry. Okay. They get a full exercise, so we've ha we have safety there. They're all seen by myself or so two other colleagues. Bruce protocol ergometry, something like that? Uh, we, we, we do an incremental on a bicycle. <laughs> yeah, yeah with, with 12 lead ECG, so we do a yeah. cardiac so stress so test as well. So a full CPAP? Uh, full CPAP. With 12 lead ECG. And, and this is, does not slow you on entry? Because well, that's, that used to slow us. But we're doing that for other reasons too, you know, for research and so forth. It's more expensive than the education in this country. Yeah. So, you know, our, our, from our healthcare system, that isn't a, it's a problem. The exercise test, we can do as many as we want. We had more problems getting rehab than exercise. The exercise by, you know, it's funny, it's not a barrier. So then when we have the rehab, the third, yes, yeah. Insurance pay for the program? Well, so yeah. You have to pay extra for the no, insurance, insurance pays. For everything. You know, we have single payer. So every, the one million people who live in Saskatchewan, yeah. it's just single payer, government. That's it. We don't have any private insurance. Okay. And they pay for the... They do. The, uh, yeah. So they fund the system. The patient doesn't pay anything, doesn't have to pay anything extra. Okay. But if you want to stay over the three months, does it pay? Yeah. Yeah, they'll pay for forever. Because this is how it works, you know. Yeah. The, the HMO pays for 25 visits. Yes. And the rest is up to them if they want to continue. And they yeah. pay per, 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 per uh, No, we don't, we don't have a blended system. Ours is just single payer. In the United States, they've now said they're not paying for rehab at all. <laughs> and what's happened to rehab? It's gone, almost. Mm -hmm. Because they've taken away the ridiculous, but they're trying to save money, you know. So part of it is, your, is the environment. I don't ha we don't have handicap in Canada in terms of, of uh, the access for rehab. How they control cost is they say, well, you can't have a rehab center there or there or there. They won't staff the rehab sites, and that's how they, they control. Or they try and build up a wait list, and we can sort of work around that. So the, the third pillar is the, the self-management skills to try and we use Kate Laurie's uh, program, L-O-R-I-G from Seattle, to try and enhance their self-management. And then in the middle, this is sort of where we have the team, the nurse clinician working with the family physician to try and optimize the care. So there's nothing unique about this. It's exercise, optimal care, and self-management. And in the health region, this is what we've been able to do. Uh, our readmission rates are reduced by about 23%, hospital days by 22, ICU days by 44. It's, it's just nothing magical. It just works. Though the comprehensive program benefits, those people who are in all three pillars, one year follow-up for a program, our readmission rates are reduced by 71%. Hospital days by 62%, ER visits by 44%. Cool. You, exactly. So you can see when you show this data, the data cool. to the administrators. Yeah. 
Well, no, no, see, if, if we are using it as sort of an evidence uh, vis-a-vis uh, healthcare decision makers here in Israel, uh, not published, it's not published, but it's it's in the uh, Saskatoon Health Region Annual Report, okay. SHR Region Annual Report, and the SGRQ went down by 8.3, and Borbeau's got very similar, like from McGill as well, eh? from Jean Borbeau, 5.6 at six and 5.3 at 12 down. So anything more than four, as you know, with SGRQ is significant. And a three-year follow-up, this is a one-year program that we've sort of, our formal intervention, and then we let go after a year. They can still exercise, but the nurses don't, aren't in contact with them. So even after three years, our re readmission rates are down, hospital days by 29%, and year visits by 30. So, you know, you, you're doing good, you're improving quality of life, and then you also, you know, reduce the, the health care costs. So that's, that's what the benefit is, and that's why we've been able to um, uh, get buy-in from the system for this specific program. And what we did is we, we said for diabetes, you do this, you do this, and then you enhance the diabetes. For heart failure, you do this, you do this, and then you optimize the heart failure. So what's unique in COPD is, is just the middle. So in our program, the COPDers have a blue t-shirt, the heart failure people have black t-shirts, but they're kind of doing the same thing. And so there's efficiencies that way. Okay. And the oxygen is uh, through the wall or bottles? Yeah, so, so oxygen was a big problem. Uh, what we were able to do is uh, there are four vendors in our province for oxygen that have government contracts. They in the rehab program, they supply the oxygen for free. And in fact, we have liquid oxygen with a small canister. So every patient has a small liquid oxygen. And we're very lucky. Uh, in order to get oxygen in the community, you have to kind of meet, you know, 55 or 60, the, the usual criteria for, for supplemental oxygen. And then um, I was just going to close with some, most of our resources are at the website copdtoolkit.org. So there's about 160 files with all of our forms and so forth. You can download, take out our logo, put in your logo, change them, whatever the case would be. Uh, and Kylie gave her, uh, the ones from Australia that she was using, respiratoryguidelines.ca. That's gave it to Yes, yeah, yeah. Well, and you've got your own, yeah, exactly. And then the ACCP, chestnut.org. I still think Roger Goldstein's textbook, you know, textbooks are becoming blasé, but this is a very good textbook, very good textbook. And then the guidelines, the ATS, ERS ones are coming out, and then our Canadian ones as well. Why, why I heard from Roger that the, uh, the uh, program that I saw in 2006 uh, in Calgary, the, uh, you know, the, the community center-based program sort of uh, uh, died. Uh, yeah. You, yeah? Well, the, the, the folks here don't know anything so about it. So Cal Calgary, which is about 1.2 million people just in the community, within a province of about 3 million people, had a state-of-the-art pulmonary rehab within chronic disease management, 11 sites throughout the center, very sophisticated, very integrated, all electronic, um, and they had a, they got a new CEO of the health system and withdrew everything. It just collapsed, just because completely that. collapsed, because, what, what because the administrator said uh, this is not a wise way to spend money, took it away. Really? So Gordon Ford, do you know Gordon Ford? Yeah, yeah. yeah he's a great guy. So he was like depressed for two years. Um, because they had, they had the, the, the best program, unbelievable. We did a site visit. Much of what we do, we took from them. There were just some things they, they did funny, but uh, they had a, a state-of-the-art state of the program. Yeah, but they also had the idea of, uh, of the community yes. extension where, where, where there was only a kinesiologist and maybe a nurse, and yes. a GP would send the patient with a release form, and you would exercise there whether we... Uh, yeah. Yeah, whether it was heart failure, COPD, diabetic, whatever. Arthritis, their philosophy was rehab needs to be in the community. And they wanted anywhere but the hospital. Anything we can do to get people to exercise is better than no exercise at all. And they were effective. They, had, they demonstrated uh, endpoints. They had physiologic training, uh, but it, it just fell apart. So uh, the station is uh, not multidisciplinary, nothing but exercise. Uni-disciplinary. Uh, exercise, exercise, exercise. This is, you know, this is politics to you, right? Politics, it's uh, cells, you know, I think. 
if I, you know, if I, if I were putting a program together and I had a lot of resources, I would have a lot of different um, um, uh, professionals there. I'd have exercise, I would have dietitian, I would have pharmacist, I would have nurses and so forth. Um, and in fact, that's what Roger has at his institution. He's got a state-of-the-art program, including in hospital. But at the beginning, it's tough to be multidisciplinary when you're, you know, you're having so small. But you, I think you do want to work towards that. I think you do want to work to that side. Similarly with the exercise. Yeah, at the yeah, start, the it's aerobic, but then you build. The thing, yeah, yeah, the thing is that when it's it displayed out front, it deters uh, the healthcare decision maker because they look at it, it's tons of money. And yeah. you have to shrink it down to the essentials in order to persuade them to get started. So uh, this is a double-edged sword. So yeah. uh, that, that, that's my experience. The first group, we spent quite a bit of time you know, techniques to get the administrators to say yes the first time. Then you, you do something, collect data, show benefit, and then you get a, ask for a little bit more. If I had this much more, I could do this much more good. And then you do it, and then you, you know, those sorts of things. By the time that they are behind you and support you, then you can state that it's much yeah. Th then they like it. Because, yeah. You know, look what we've done. Well, exactly. And then, you know, and then you have this sort of stuff. They, I mean, they get excited when they see that. When you start, I need one physio, one nurse. And, uh, one, let, let me get and one bike. And a bike, yeah. Or a trade. And 10 patients. <laughs> 10 patients, there too. No. Patients recruitment in our system is not a problem because I told you, through, especially if you go and, and if you uh, target patients that, uh, uh, that have exacerbated, then I can you know, get them through our databases like that. Uh, can get Will they patients. come? Mm -hmm. That's the other issue. You know, some of them are mine. I know that they'll come. I have sort of a waiting list just to start. But, uh, uh, but the number of patients is not really an issue. Accessibility might be because we are, you know, it's it's uh, our region is is a bit sort of rural, not like. Tell you that the um, HMO flying four people from Milan to our program. Yeah. Yeah. And they pay for the flights. Who pays? Wow. For flights? Uh, the Ministry of Defense is not Kupat Cholim. Not Minister of Defense, I'm saying Kupat Kupat Cholim, why? Because they don't have an, uh, an answer down there? Some people... Uh, well, okay. you know what, in, in America, I don't have even a plane going to... <laughs> 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 it's joking. But at, at first, when we just established the program, so the administrator suggests that we show them the nice outcome. So they ask us, do we have nice outcome like the one cited in Canada? And it's regularly because they won't support the patient, so I couldn't train them, yeah. and yet they expected to see the outcome. So, yeah, so, so well, exactly. Uh, what, what's your failure? You can't have them maintain the... Uh, no, at the beginning, uh, Shuki Shemer asked us, show uh -huh. us that you are as good as the Canada. Now can you show, what, what's yeah, your outcome? Well, you can show yeah. So what we did at the very beginning, that's the same thing. They said, well, what have you done? I said, we haven't done anything because you haven't given us. We showed Borbeau's data. And we said, if you give us a little bit of money, we asked for 18 months because we, we thought we needed 12-month evaluation. We said 18 months, we will evaluate. And we worked like a devil to make sure we got the right patients, showed the signal, got benefit, and then we got a little bit more. It's, it's hard, though, because they, uh, you're, it's competitive against heart and diabetes and all these other sorts of things, stents. You know, it goes on and on. Okay, thank you very much. Yes.